So today, um, I'm going to speak on corruption and money laundering, and I wish to extend my th thanks to the TTTI for inviting me to present on this topic. The FIU, of course, welcomes every opportunity to bring sensitization on the topic of money laundering and how we combat it. So first I will start off with, I know a lot of you are familiar with this term, but just as a reminder, what is money laundering? And this is a term which describes activities carried out to legitimize income derived from criminal conduct. These activities are intended to obscure or hide the fact that the funds actually came from a criminal source. And I will speak further about the activities of placement, placing the funds into the financial system, layering the funds so that there are persons or companies between the criminal and the funds, and then finally integration, where the funds come back, the criminal funds come back to the criminal clean, so that then he can use it as if they were legitimately um, earned. So let's look at a simple money laundering scenario so you can understand a little bit better what it means. Let's look at a situation of Joe. Joe has acquired lots of cash from his successful, in inverted com um, close commas, successful drug trafficking business. He is not legitimately employed, so he does not want law enforcement to suspect that he's earning his money from criminal activity. So he needs a money laundering scheme. What does he do? He manages to get $2 million, which he has in cash because, you know, in drug trafficking, you don't get paid by links or credit cards. So he has his money in cash and he puts it in a bank account held by his mother. And he does so by depositing small amounts into the account over a period of time so that it does not attract attention. So now he has some of the drug money successfully in, into the financial system, so that's a placement. And as well, it is no longer in cash, so the form is converted into money in a bank. That's placement. That's, that's normally regarded as the first step in successful money laundering. Secondly, Joe bought a mini-mart with the two million, and he put that mini-mart in his mother's name again. So this is the process of layering. He has layered the funds, he has put the funds, he has put somebody else between himself and the funds. In one instance, the bank account in his, his mother's name, so he's not connected to it. In the other case, the Minimart is in his mother's name, so he's not connected to it. So if law enforcement is searching for him, they will not find any bank account in his name and they would not find any business in his name. So now Joe is a manager for Minimart. And every day when he deposits the daily takings of the Minimart into the bank account, he mixes in it some of his drug money. So then the mini part appears to be very successful. And then Joe can pay himself a nice salary because the mini mart is successful and he can show that he has money from a legitimate source. He is now a businessman. He can pay taxes, he can buy a car, or buy a house. He can do whatever he wishes with that money now because it appears to be legitimately owned. Now let's look at corruption, and uh, you've heard about this before. What is corruption? Definition by the World Bank, basically, it's abuse of public office for private gains. And then we look at corruption at two levels. We consider what is called petty corruption, and this is probably what would be experienced by everyday citizens more often. It's small payments to low-level bureaucrats in order to get small favors in return. For example, a driver's permit. And some of you may have heard about this. The motor vehicle license stickers. I understand some people did not even have to present their car to any inspection centers to get that sticker. And so that's a small fish. Now look at the big fish. That's where grand corruption come in. And this is usually related to a higher level of bureaucrat and politicians. These are people who really have the power to make decisions in regard to the award of large contracts. So while the petty corruption might be visible, and you may hear a lot of that on a day-to-day -day basis, the grand corruption usually only comes to your attention 
when there is some kind of public scandal. So what is the link between money laundering and corruption? We have to remember that legitimately earned money is not laundered. It's only money which is which has been which is the proceeds of crime, any criminal act. So in our legislation we have provisions there for the proceeds from crime which is violent crime as well as non-violent crime where the proceeds of that crime can be laundered through a process which we spoke about money laundering so when sometimes persons talk about money laundering as being white colored crime if we go back a little bit to where the money came from is it really white color crime we're dealing with because a violent crime from which persons can get financial rewards or financial benefits is things like murder for hire, kidnapping for ransom, trafficking in arms, drugs, persons, extortion, robbery. All of that is violent crime and can lead to the proceeds being laundered as well as corruption, bribery, fraud, tax crimes, and forgery. So after the crime has been committed, then money laundering happens. And thirdly, if successful, that money laundering scheme then would en enable the criminal to enjoy the benefits of his crime. So the kickbacks and the theft of public funds, if successfully clean, that is money laundering. And that's the link between both corruption and money laundering. Now, you've heard about the effects of successful money laundering, successful corruption, and of course money laundering. So I wouldn't go into too much detail about it. So of course the adverse effects, and I'll just look at four very briefly. Foreign direct investment. If a country is regarded as a country in which corruption is rampant, corruption is going, um, continuing unchecked or with impunity, instead of projects then being financed by foreign direct investment, that means investors wanting to invest in our country, corrupt countries would have to borrow money for their projects. And secondly, I don't know how many of you have heard of Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, Bahamas Papers. All of those situations involve illicit financial flows. That means when corruption, as usually I'm talking about grand corruption, takes place, the proceeds, which are millions, need to be hidden outside of the country. So to get it outside of the country, persons use things like wire transfers to offshore accounts, you open offshore accounts, business and transactions involving shell companies, shell banks, and of course, trade misinvoicing. So these are some of the techniques which assist the money in going out of the country. Illicit financial flows, and that's probably why sometimes countries have problems with foreign exchange. The other thing is the cost of doing business goes up because you need to factor into your project cost the month sums that you will have to pay to, for the licenses and the permits, etc. But more importantly, in a case where corruption is rampant, public investments, what do you think would happen with public investments? Do you think it would be easily allocated to the sectors and programs where the need is greatest? Or would it be allocated to those programs where the prospects for personal enrichment is higher? And that is a problem we have to seriously consider, where public tenders may be awarded to the highest incentive payer rather than the person who can do the job better. And then finally, this hits home. Government our government every year has a huge amount of its budget allocated to social welfare um, expenses. If the money which is intended to go to help in education, health, poverty reduction is diverted elsewhere, these situations would remain unaddressed. Our people are not going to be we're not going to have the money to help them get scholarships. We are not going to have hospitals in the, in the sorry, 
beds in the hospitals, we are not going to have the drugs. And so often you will have to put your hand in your pocket and pay for the drugs, even though you have gone to the hospital. And this is a problem we have heard about recently as well. The money when there was a flooding, where did that money go? Are we sure that all of it went towards the place it was supposed to go? So how does the international community view us? Let's look at the corruption, per corruption perceptions index, 2015 to 2018. I know I have it a bit upside down. Um, look at how we rate with the other countries in the Caribbean. Barbados is way up there. They rank 25 as being the least corrupt. Their score is 68 and seems to have been consistent more or less except for 2016. The score there, not the rank, the score, closer to 100 means the country is less corrupt. Okay? So all those countries there except Guyana are regarded as less corrupt than Trinidad. Can you see that? And let's look at another international indicator. Trace International Bribery Risk Matrix. And this trace measures the business bribery risk in 200 countries. And this is a free tool that compliance professionals usually use in order to assess the level of business-related bribery risk in countries where they operate. And again, we have the countries, most of them doing better than Trinidad and Tobago. The total risk score, let's look at Barbados, which is 45, means they have a 45% of bribery. Look at Trinidad and Tobago. We are higher. We are 55%. In this case, the higher percentage is not good. And we are 113 out of 200 com um, countries, just between Suriname and Guyana. So tell me again where foreign direct investment is going to go. Is it going to come first to Trinidad in light of what we are seeing here? And then let's look at another, another situation, the World Economic Global Forum Competitiveness Report, which is published every year, and Mr. Um, West mentioned it. But for two years straight, corruption has been ranked as in one of the first three um, factors which um, is, is a problem for doing business in Trinidad and Tobago. That's together with poor, poor work ethics and inefficient government bureaucracy. Now with inefficient government bureaucracy, are you surprised then that corruption is at that level? If that is number two, sometimes a number three, because that encourages person to ask for and get these what we call small favors in return for benefit. And of course, our Prime Minister has talked about corruption being a disease, about corruption needing to be eradicated, and so on. So what are the avenues that we have in Trinidad and Tobago for greater transparency to reduce corruption? There's the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, and Trinidad and Tobago is a party to that convention, so it binds Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm looking at two of the UNCAT principles, which is, first, prevent corruption, and that's UNCAT's focus. Prevent corruption rather than engage your scarce resources in addressing its consequences. And secondly, second strategy is, increase the risk of getting caught and that appropriate sanctions would follow. Because so often we talk about crime operating with impunity. So if there's a, a very low chance of getting caught, you will probably take a risk because the risk is so low of getting caught and getting punished and facing the consequences. So uncut principles are prevent and dissuade. And we have um, complied with several of these measures and I just point out one to you, which is the creation of an arm of the TTPS. Well, now it's part of the TTPS the Anti-Corruption Investigative Branch, the ACIB as it is commonly known. That was established in pursuance of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. And now we have the FATF 40, 40 recommendations for anti-money laundering and counterfinancing of terrorism. Now we call them recommendations, but they are mandatory. We need to put those recommendations in place, implement them, or else we face certain 
adverse consequences. So FATF is more about deterring and detecting. And then we have our own laws which provide this umbrella of strategies which include all the strategies of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption as well as FATF and then the prosecution includes prosecution as well and seizure of assets on conviction. So let's look quickly at FATF transparency and privacy because I think it's relevant here. One of FATF, FATF's main themes throughout the recommendation is that you must know the person with whom you're doing business. Know your customer. So financial institutions must take all measures to be able to identify the customer on whose behalf they are opening accounts and conducting transactions. Included in the know your customer um, provisions and policies is a requirement to pay attention to particular, more attention to particular customers, and these are called politically exposed persons. Who are these persons? Those are persons to whom financial institutions must pay more scrutiny, monitor their transactions, and they are individuals who have been entrusted with prominent, prominent public functions, such as head of state or government, senior politicians, senior government, judicial or military officers, senior executive of state-owned uh, state incorpora corporations and important party political officials. And I think we have a pep in our audience that I can see right now. And beneficial owners of companies. Um, what does that mean? It means the person who ultimately owns the company, who the main shareholder. But oftentimes when there's an owner on record, the owner of the shares is in fact another company. So then you need to go behind that company to find a person and that may take several levels. You may go, need to go after three or four layers to find the actual person. So that's beneficial ownership of companies and we spoke about that before. And then beneficial owners of of transactions for example you know oftentimes you may conduct a transaction on behalf of a, your mother your father your brother your sister there is a need to disclose that the transaction is being conducted on behalf of someone else now it's simple if you're doing it on a personal level for personal reasons but there are other persons who act as nominees for companies and that way the person the principal can hide behind that nominee and we will never know who is the real beneficiary of that transaction. Of course, many countries are creating beneficial ownership registr um, registries and have already done so, and Trinidad and Tobago is, in fact, moving towards that step with the recent amendment to the Companies Act. Now, what is our legislative framework? We do have, these are just some of the important ones. The Financial Intelligence Unit Act, Proceeds of Crime, Integrity in Public Life, Freedom of Information, PCA Act, Prevention of Corruption. So we have a number of legislation, um, legislation there in place. With respect to the Financial Intelligence Unit, um, our report this year, in 2018, has in fact revealed about 18 million. But corruption usually goes hand in hand with other offenses such as forgery and fraud because other persons, non-public persons, may be party to that corruption scheme. And fraud and forgery was identified as amounting to over $509 million. And this is information from the FIU's annual report, 2018. So some level of effectiveness has been achieved between 2017 and 2018 in tackling corruption by the anti-corruption investigative branch of the TTPS. And so far, from 16th of October 2017 to 31st of July 2018, I think they need to update these stats, 13 persons have been charged for a total amount of approximately 26 million. Can I add? Am I adding correctly? And it's conspiracy to defraud, falsification of accounts, money laundering. Um, you won't see um, corruption there because what corruption is, the offense in our law, is an offense against the Prevention of Corruption Act. So it's not called corruption as an offense. 
And in the last two cases, the, case, the charges here on the 31st of July 2018, that's 11 persons. That related to one fraudulent, allegedly fraudulent act which took place in the Sour Regional Corporation where monies meant for the corporation were diverted onto, into someone else, these 10 people's pockets. Um, and this next piece of legislation, the Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Property Act, a very important piece of legislation, passed in 2015, and it establishes an Office of Procurement which would set out certain guidelines for good practices in awarding contracts and even provide um, the procuring entity, which would be the ministry, with standard contracts. And there are a lot of provisions there for good governance, accountability to ensure um, value for money, transparency. And if um, procuring entities, which are ministries, etc., breach any of that, they would come within the, the, the uh, purview of the regulator, procurement regulator. And this is an important piece of legislation which is intended to ensure that contracts are awarded to persons who deserve them. They are not awarded to uh, criminal elements in our society because I don't think we want to be a country where we have state-funded criminality. So we are waiting for um, regulations to be approved before it becomes fully implemented. And there are other legislation here. Reducing corruption legislation. Strategic Service Agency Act. You may want to know what this has to do with it. But what this act did, it expanded the remit of the SSA to gather intelligence which can be used in investigations for a wide range of offenses where previously it was restricted to drug trafficking, now it could, almost any serious crime, it could gather intelligence on. And then it can share with a wider audience, such as the National Security Ministry, Customs and Excise, all of TTPS, and um, Defense Force, and any other ministry or department that the minister um, thinks fit, and the minister does this by order. Then we have the other three pieces of legislation are intended to expedite cases through the courts. Because one thing and one, one allegation has been made in this country is that justice is being delayed, delayed unduly. So there, therefore there's no justice. Persons have to wait 5, 10, 15 years, 20 years for their matters to come to a conclusion. So these pieces of legislation, let's look at the miscellaneous provisions, trial by judge alone legislation. That, is in that gives the accused the option to be tried by a judge instead of a judge and jury. So doing it that way would mean there would be no jury selection process and you would have to put jury th juries out of the court, which has to happen from time to time in a trial by judge. So it will save time. And in fact, we did have the, the first, I'm sorry, the verdict was delivered in the first trial by judge alone case in February 18, 2019. So this amendment, this, I'm um, sorry, this provision, this law has already been implemented for the first time. And then the second, sorry, the last act there, the Miscellaneous Provisions Act, that was an amendment to the poker which expedited cases through the court again because it made money laundering an offense which could be tried in the magistrate's court not just in the high court. So, you know, the high court, you have to have a preliminary inquiry and then the case goes to the high court to be heard. In the magistrate's court, you don't have to have a preliminary inquiry. So the intention is to expedite the cases through the courts. And in fact, um, we have been very successful in implementing that legislation. When I say we, I mean the country, TTPS, the TPP's office, in implementing that legislation because there have been three money laundering cases within the last month, two this week, where the accused pled guilty and the matter was heard at the magistrate's court. So we have three successful money laundering convictions so far. And if those matters had to go to the high court, um, it wouldn't have started as yet. So that is just some of the legislation which have been enacted already to improve um, the, the 
um, cases to the core of the criminal justice system and thereby reducing corruption in our society. Because if your matters can be heard faster, the chances of being caught and facing the consequences will increase. How do we crack down on corruption? And I think we need to do something that would be new to us. Um, we know that the use of cash makes countries vulnerable to money laundering. Cash intensive economies are more vulnerable to money laundering because cash is private, it's anonymous. If I give you money, there is no trace. Not that I'm going to give you money. Yeah. <laughs> There's no transactional history. Yeah, you have to declare it when you leave in the country and all that. No transactional history. So nobody knows who is giving what and who is receiving what. And um, there have been reports in terms of property fraud that persons have been using cash to buy property. And you know, in Trinidad and Tobago, the average property costs at least one million. I'm just talking about house and land. One million, two million, three million, that's normal. So imagine somebody purchasing property with a million or two million in a suitcase. I don't know how it will fit, but reports are about that. So like some countries, I am suggesting we can, we can tighten up our situation and reduce corruption in a certain way. Either have what is called a currency reporting system so that if cash above a certain amount is used in a transaction, the business would have to report it to the FIU. An alternative which may be more drastic and we may not quite be ready for it yet is to reduce, um, restrict the use of cash in transactions. And I could give you an example right here who. Before um, 20, what year was it, 2016 I think, Jamaica had what is called a currency transaction report. So any transaction above 15,000 US, which is carried out for any goods or services in Jamaica, in cash, had to be reported to the FI. Then in 2016, they changed the law. And they said now, any transaction, 10,000 US dollars and above, cannot be made in cash. You have to go put the money in the bank and get a bank check. So you can't pay for goods if it costs over $10,000 US and above in cash. So thereby, they are restricting the use of cash in their country. And I must tell you, um, that kind of scenario, Jamaica has in fact created a lot of goodwill in the international community for passing those pieces of legislation. So that's my presentation to you today and thank you very much for listening.